Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to you all. I am Father Simon Robinson, the parish priest in the parish of Minehead. We're part of the Diocese of Bath and Wells. And today, our service of Eucharist with a sermon and spiritual communion comes from the magnificent parish church of St Michael, which is situated on North Hill in Minehead. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, and whatever you are carrying this day, you are very welcome. One of the great joys of being the parish priest here in Minehead for me is the fact that as a congregation we are diverse. We represent the breadth of the Church of England from Evangelical through to Anglo-Catholic. My own tradition is Anglo-Catholic. Through the grace of God we are able to worship together as sisters and brothers in Christ and it's a great joy. Also because we have three buildings our three churches can offer uh, different flavours of church in terms of liturgy and worship. Services in St Michael's are of the more Catholic nature, the more formal nature, and uh, fit with this beautiful building. And you'll see that in our online Eucharist today. The Gospel today is read by Anne, Anne O'Connor, who is a reader in the Church of England and is our church warden and a long-established member of the community here in Minehead. Philippa Gary offers our intercessions today and will lead us as we pray for the church and for the world. As we prepare to worship Almighty God, who is both loving and merciful, we hold a moment of silence and of contemplation. We say the prayer of preparation together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. And so we call to mind those moments over the past week when we have not been the person God created us to be. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us. A reading from St Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 7, beginning at verse 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but, in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can do what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. 
for I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said to the crowds, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father and no one knows the Son except the Father. 
and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of God, whose Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Over these past four months, worldwide history has and is being written at an acutely intense pace. We've all seen much change. Societal norms have been challenged from the way that we shop to the way that we socialise. We've seen political turbulence on a grand scale, the exposing of deeply discriminatory attitudes. Statues have tumbled, politicians have been challenged, and millions have been sick and hundreds of thousands have lost their lives to COVID-19, let alone to other illnesses and diseases. And with all of this, within all of this, the church also has had to change. We have moved from the beautiful gift of open doors, of warm and comforting fellowship, of hymn singing and the celebration of the great gift that Jesus gave us in the sacrament of the altar in the Eucharist. And we've moved to a time of closed doors, of church in other, possibly even alien forms, online church, internet church church down a telephone. And all of this has required of us a profound increase in the need for us to be self-reliant in our discipleship and in our faith commitment. We've not had access to each other or to the very many rituals and routines that we take for granted and that this current season have for me exposed are of profound importance to our very existence as Christians. I'm grateful that some of you have expressed your feelings to me. They range from fear and anxiety, to loss and depression, to frustration and to anger. Some of you have felt shut out or even rejected by the church. No one person's feelings are greater or less than anyone's else. And if anything, this time of lockdown has given us all a moment for true and deep reflection on what matters in our lives and most crucially, what matters in our hearts. And there is, of course, a longing that we can return to what was. Now there is a faint glimmer of hope, but it cannot be a hope of return to what was. Rather, it is a hope of moving towards what must be, to what we must become, individually and as the body of Christ, the Church, here in Minehead. And I do believe that we must identify the positive lessons learned from this season as much as we must identify the lessons learned from mistakes made nationally, be they political, or mistakes made locally, be they personal. From the anxiety and the depression that many of us have experienced, from societal unrest, and from the further exposing of extreme worldwide poverty, and from the profound blossoming of creation that has been enabled by the lack of travel in polluting vehicles of every kind. We've always had the opportunity to learn and to be renewed, 
we've not always recognised that opportunity or been able or willing to welcome it. As we face this moment of the restoration of our lives post the current lockdown, the church faces lessons that could lead us to a time of real renewal. Renewal of the church is not about style. There are as many Anglo-Catholic churches committed to renewal and mission as there are evangelical and charismatic churches. Renewal is about our hearts, our minds and our souls being reorientated to the very purposes of God through prayer, through study of scripture and the celebration of sacrament, leading us to a place of deliberate invitation of others onto their journey into the compassionate and merciful heart of God. And if we're properly honest, all of us have had our hearts, our minds and our souls tugged, battered, possibly even assaulted by fears and losses through these difficult times. Where then do you turn for rest and restoration? And of course, that's a question that you must answer for yourself. I can't answer it for you. However, I can, and I do believe most fervently, that renewal is the act of deliberately and confidently turning back to Jesus Christ, to the Christ that Matthew proclaims is the deep well of rest, the one who offers us the possibility that we do not carry our burdens alone, but are held by he who carries them with us. Words such as duty, discipline and order are sadly and increasingly deemed old-fashioned. And words such as community, collaboration, and partnership are also rather sadly being trumped by a culture of individualism. Even the church suffers from this. I think we face the danger of watering down the concept of the common good when we focus on the individual alone. St Paul challenges this in chapter 7 of his letter to the Romans, which should really be read with chapter 8 as a single unit. And if you don't read the whole of both chapters, it's possible to end up with a meaning that is not what Paul intended. So I commend reading chapter 7 and chapter 8 to you. Paul knew the Torah, the Jewish law and the foundation of his society very well. And the central character of this Romans reading is the Torah. Paul insists that the Torah is holy and good. It's not the cause of sin or death for the Israelites. Our modern parallel has to be the laws of both the land and our church. They are there for a similar reason. They are intrinsically good and just. They're there for the greater and the common good. Lockdown and social distancing are good examples of how this common good is manifest. However, I do also think that human laws and indeed the Torah are by their very nature incomplete. For those of us who have an awareness of sin and what that means, the law of Torah and the law of the land can only make sense when we consider them in the light of sin. Sin's not a popular subject. We tie ourselves in knots over it. Many of us live with feelings of shame or disappointment at former or even present ways. Paul is referring to exactly this in verses 15 to 20. In giving our lives to God, we choose to move our lives from lives bound by law, the old ways of faith through law, to lives bound by grace, God's grace. God's heavenly laws 
are laws that require us to live differently to how we lived before we awoke to the fact that God's love for us is eternal and free. In committing our lives to God, we do not see a different world. We see the world differently. In the same way, we do not see a different life. We see our life differently. This should lead every one of us to become conscious of the central fact that we very easily live out our lives in our own strength. Verses 16 and 17 of Matthew, they state this. We played a flute for you and you did not dance. We played a dirge for you and you did not mourn. I think our current times challenge this reliance on the individual. We need each other. I certainly have needed other people. And we need Jesus Christ. For Paul, rescue comes from Jesus Christ. For Matthew, becoming unburdened comes from Jesus' invitation to be liberated, to be born again. In Jesus, we find true liberation, true freedom, new birth, through which we become yoked into the life of Jesus. At a time when so much is so uncertain, not least how the church and how society will be in the forthcoming post-COVID-19 era, these two readings are a call to renewal, to the renewal of the church that comes when the Holy Spirit is welcomed into our midst, when we recognise that we are part of something beyond our own needs and our own preferences. Now, as we prepare to reopen churches, to re-emerge into society, indeed, to possibly even rebuild the church and to rebuild the society we are part of, we must most urgently and most prayerfully reflect on what is the true purpose of the church here in this place. We must also reflect on how we point to Jesus and on how we are apostles of the faith, fervent in prayer and service and mission. How we feed the poor and tend the sick within the community of which we're part. Paul and Matthew challenge us to answer this question. Are we prepared to be gentle and humble in heart? To truly learn from Jesus? To allow ourselves to be changed like Paul who was bound by one way and yet so needed to be rescued by Jesus? Paul saw that need and then allowed himself to be yoked to the Son of God. Are we prepared to do the same? Life for us all will now never be the same. That never being the same was not caused by COVID-19, far from it. It was caused by our baptism into the faith. Renewal is not a one-off event. It is the way of the Christian. It is the way of Christ, a world hungry for food, for justice, for compassion, for equity and fairness, is a world crying out for Jesus. It is the world that we are part of and into which God has called us. Paul knew this, so did Matthew. It's a world carrying heavy burdens a world that needs rest, a world that wails, and a world in which the flute is playing. Let us work hard then to rebuild, to restore and renew, 
and ensure that all hear the heavenly melody that's being played upon that flute. Amen. In the power of the Spirit, and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Dear Creator God, your love is older than the hills, newer than the shiny green leaf, more lovely than the sunset, purer than the mother's kiss. Your love is with us always. We thank you for your abiding friendliness towards us. Please help us always to do your will. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, we see your mind in the vision that created the NHS 75 years ago. Through it, you have blessed and healed millions ever since. In this terrible pandemic, we see your gentle spirit at work, strengthening the dedicated doctors, nurses, carers, cleaners, consultants, paramedics, and so many others, all pitting their skills against this sickness. We ask your blessing for each one. We grieve for those who lost their lives. We pray that those who work so long and so hard may have rest of body and of soul. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Father, thank you for all our brothers and sisters in the worldwide church as we unite in prayer today. Give us the mind of Jesus in sunshine and in storm. When troubles come, turning our trust into fear, take us into your quiet presence and be our refuge. When you task us with helping another, even though our strength is small, give us joy in serving you. All our times are in your hand and your purpose is for our good. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, all over the world, the sun, moon and stars declare your love and your earth brings forth her wonders. And yet, many suffer, longing for rescue and for healing. We ask for your strength for all who seek the common good, the righting of deep wrongs, the fair sharing of the earth's bounty, for respect for each other's culture, traditions, race and gender, for a clean environment, for release for those oppressed by tyranny and exposed to terror, war and famine. Lord, hear their cry and be their strong defender. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Lord, you sent Jesus to be part of our human family. We pray for families that are torn apart for those who feel lonely and forgotten. He worked in a carpenter's shop. We cry to you for so many <clears throat> who have lost and still are losing their work, their normal life, their future, their security, everything they have built up. Be with governments everywhere seeking to find ways to help. In these difficult days, Many wait in pain for treatment postponed or are afraid to ask. Lord Jesus, companion of, their, of our weariness, lighten the anxious time of waiting until they can be healed. Lord, in your mercy. <clears throat> God, our Father, we are reminded how fragile this lovely gift of life is. So many have gone through the gate of death and we will too. Free us from our fears, comfort us with the promise that where you are, 
there shall all your servants be. Welcome them, we pray, into the house and gate of heaven, where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity, in the habitations of thy glory and dominion, world without end. Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time of physical distancing, it's really important, I believe, for us as Christians to remember that we have a common life and that eventually we will all be back together as families and as friends and as worshipping communities. And so we come to that moment of the peace. And as we share the peace one with another, be it virtually or with those that we live with, let us hold in our hearts that hope uh, of returning to a common life. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us, 
and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on our Bishop Peter and all your people, and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary, our patrons Michael, Andrew and Peter and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, 
we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you. But only say the word, and I shall be healed. Let us pray. Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and of peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My thanks go to everybody who was involved in today's service. Uh, thank you ever so much for your part in our worship today. I've said this several times, but I'm going to say it again. My thanks go to you all for your patience and your forbearance at such a complicated time. Uh, please pray for the PCC, the Church Council, and also for the little group uh, of us, which consists of Anne, Diane, uh, myself, John, Lynn and Tracy, and supported by Richard, as we try to understand the national guidance from the government and from the National Church, and locate that in our decision-making here in Minehead, in terms of opening the churches for private prayer, as well as beginning to think about uh, how we can offer a service uh, to those of you who uh, wish, should and are able to come to church. St Andrews will be open this week on Wednesday from 2 till 4 for individual private prayer. Um, uh, you will have had some information about that um, which I sent to you uh, either via email 
or letter and it will explain to you what you can expect if you arrive at the church. But again, please be um, careful. Please think about whether that is something you should do um, uh, following the national guidance. Uh, I will be on duty, so I will be there at an appropriately social distance from anybody who comes into the church to pray. So we bow our heads to receive God's blessing. The Lord be with you. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those that you love and pray and care for this day and always. Amen. The Eucharist has ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.